everyone and welcome back to my booktube channel Lisa in Bookland. This is my April reading wrap up. It is quite a short one. I only have six books here to read. One of them is a play and I think uh, two or three of them I read in like the first week of the month. But yeah, busy month, but I did manage to squeeze some reading in. I actually, um, we had a bank holiday weekend at the end of April and the Monday was the first uh, day of May, May Day. And I actually did finish, I think, four books on the 1st of May that I'd been reading throughout the month and I was humming and hawing whether to include them here or not and I eventually decided on the side of not but um yeah you'll see them in May anyways but included uh, the Victoria literature book I should have read this month Dr Thorne which was amazing I absolutely loved it but anyways on to the books that I did read so first up is a French classic well kind of uh, it's a play by Moliere called Tartuffe and uh but this is a new version by Frank Victor Guinness. This might seem like quite a random version to read but I actually went and saw this production um, which was it was premiered by the Abbey, Abbey Theatre this year. They were touring around Ireland and they came to Galway and I saw it when it was in the black box and I absolutely loved it. It was amazing. I was a bit hesitant to go and see it because I'm like oh do you know should I read like the proper play first? Like it wouldn't even have been the proper play because I'd have had to read it in translation. But yeah this is a new version like the although it's still completely in verse um, like some of the phrases used are like a little bit modern kind of a small bit of modern sensibilities but I just loved it I'm so glad I went to see it and I have to give the credit for credit is due and um, the person that really kind of made up my mind is that it was completely acceptable to go and see a new adaptation of a play that I hadn't read before was Elizabeth at Bucans of Books because she did an amazing video on like um kind of censorship of books but also like how books are updated constantly classics are updated constantly and I was like yeah sure sugar I'll just go and see it and yeah I enjoyed it so much they had this play script for sale in the theatre and I bought it and I read it straight away when I came home just in case there was anything I'd missed. This is a classic play it was first produced in 1669 so uh yeah one of the oldest things I've read and uh I would love to actually uh, read again the original or like an original translated version. It's about this kind of upper class household in France but the house has all been really shaken up because this guy called Tartuffe has arrived and he's really he's really the, the father is spellbound by him he thinks he's so holy so good but the rest of the people in the house really don't like him and I uh, think he's a bit of a hypocrite and it becomes more and more apparent to the viewer that he really is such a hypocrite and honestly you just want to, I, I'm a bit I'm, I'm a bit mixed feelings about this cover because uh, that's the actor that played him <laughs> on the stage and uh, yeah you just I never want to throw something at the stage as much <laughs> it was like going back to Shakespearean times it just hated him so much um but it was just a brilliant brilliant play but a brilliant production as well I absolutely loved it so I say there's kind of a modern sensibility on it I, I've never seen as anything as bizarre on stage albeit I haven't seen a lot of plays but so all I, I don't know why they don't do this more often like all of the I suppose I keep interrupting myself I suppose it's kind of like if Persuasion the film the last time if they adapted it with modern language like and like uh, Frank McGuinness did with Tartuffe that would have been amazing because they had um, they were still all in like costume amazing costumes like period costume like the setting was old fashioned but like just the language being used and like the servants whenever the servants were off screen they'd be like slouching around or like scrolling on their phones and taking selfies and there was kind of this like modern music um, in between scenes and oh such a good example the, the stage is broken into two sections and on the smaller section Tartuffe is like uh, lashing himself with this flail um, but he's like got like a ring light in front of him. He's recording a YouTube video or a TikTok or something of him flailing himself. I thought it was brilliant anyways. Maybe not for everyone. I did get the feeling at the end that like the reaction from the audience wasn't exactly like rapturous because it was very odd especially at the end oh my god when that like person comes in but uh yeah it was I thought it was amazing so yeah it's I'm just dying to seek out more plays in fact anything that's out there I'll go and see in fact um last weekend I went and saw a abbreviated version of Romeo and Juliet in him, but that was done by Roscommon Youth Theatre by 11 and 12 year olds and it was amazing so I just yeah I it made me want to read Shakespeare seeing plays on stage is just the most amazing thing I just 
have to do them all. Um, but yes, the next book I'm going to talk about then is this one, uh, Turlock by Brian Keenan. This is on my Irish Readathon TBR, I think, and I didn't get to it, so I finished it off in April. Um, it focuses on uh, the life of this Harper, uh, Turlock O'Carolan, who is famously blind. Um, it's set in like 18th century Ireland. Um, I liked it for all of those aspects, but I will say that it's a very literary type of book um, in the way it's told. Um, it very much kind of goes back and forth in time. There's some of it that's through letters. Um, Turlock himself wasn't a particularly likeable character. I do think it portrayed a really good picture of 18th century Ireland. Um, so, you know, it just, it was just too literary for me. I'd preferred something more of a stronger story. Yeah, it didn't leave a very strong impression on me. So I don't think I'm going to say any more about it. But, um, yeah, if, if your tastes are more literary, um, yeah, it's maybe one to consider. But yeah, not just not the book for me, unfortunately. So from that onto a book that I absolutely loved an awful lot. And this is a book I picked up in London and it was Uproar, uh, Satire, Scandal and Printmakers in George and London by Alice Loxton, um, who goes on Instagram by History Alice. And she also um, presents on a, what is it, History Hit? That I, I don't pay for the subscription, but I love their videos on YouTube. I might someday. I to say that mine is signed because I went to a talk by Alice Loxton at London Print Fair as I mentioned when I was over there um, it was a great talk she was doing a talk with um, another author whose name I can't remember um, that we were, had written a more academic book on James Gilray um, I didn't pick that up because I wasn't sure if I was interested enough in James Gilray to commit myself to his very big book and also I was flying home so it was a bit big to bring in my suitcase it was more of a coffee table very big coffee table book so this book as I mentioned focuses on Georgian caricaturists but um, um, principally probably on Gilray um, who is responsible for all these lovely cartoons and I just love the colours of them is the most thing that sticks out to me um, but yeah it was kind of like the um, comic strips of the Georgian era they're very much satirised like um, people that were in society politicians um, they got lots of food for out of the Napoleonic Wars as you can see with uh, Napoleon there um, James Gilray being very famous for uh, the common mix misconception that Napoleon was short when he actually was of average height but um although the subject matter is interesting because I am obviously interested in this period what really brings it to life is just the way that Alice has of telling it I think because I watch all of her Instagram reels she she does it exactly like her Instagram reels which sounds odd it's like the most engaging and funny non-fiction book I have ever read in my life I thought it was just brilliant the way she'd managed to translate it to like quite a neat subject my favorite thing that she did throughout this book was that she'd like imagine conversations and she was very very clear that they were imagined that had happened between the personalities involved just which really I suppose remind you that these historical figures were just like us an example I just flipped through the book to find an example I'm sure it's not even the best one but she just made me laugh out loud so many times but she's talking about this painting uh, which is obviously a man that's made out of fruit in the drawing um what's the artist's name Giuseppe Arcimboldo. <laughs> These weren't just cheeks like rosy apples. They were rosy apples, positioned to appear as cheeks. You could hear the megaphone at the village fete, and for the prize of the face created out of the produce from your own garden, the award goes to Giuseppe Arcimboldo for his portrait of Rudolf II, Holy Roman Emperor, cre created from cabbages, beans, peas, plums, and all sorts. Well done, Giuseppe. Please come to the marquee to collect your rosette. <laughs> I just, it's just such a light-hearted way of telling history throughout and I just, yeah, I just think she's amazing. I can't wait uh, for what she writes about next and uh, yeah, definitely follow her on Instagram if you have any uh, interest in history because I think she's great. And uh, yeah, such a lovely, lovely person as well, I have to say. The only thing that disappointed me a little bit, and I think um, Charlotte Coiny reeds did an individual book review of this as well, which is really good, so I'll link it down below, because I think we had most of the same thoughts. But it's such a pity that it's not like a full colour book, or at least had a plate section. What it is full of, it is full of pictures, but I just think you lose so much by not seeing them in colour, because um, they actually, at the London Print Fair, they had a room that was filled with Gilray prints and full size and full colour, 
together and I spent ages looking at them. Um, I just, yeah, they were so amazing and detailed just to see the colour. Um, so yeah, it was missing from there, but at least you get the front cover, which uh, gives you the idea. So the next book then, sticking with the Regency period, is The Secret Lives of Country Gentlemen by KJ Charles. Uh, this is a romance. It's actually a new release. I think it came out in March. And uh, yeah, no, it, this is a nice, fun read. I haven't been as impressed by any of the books of hers I've read previously uh, since The Gentle Art of Fortune Hunting, but maybe that book was just like specifically written for me and I just, um, then one of them, the rest of them will be as much of a hit for me. But I still did very much enjoy it. So it follows uh, this man called Sir Gareth Inglis. He was working as a clerk in London for his uncle because his father basically kicked him out of the house when he was younger. Um, and then the father dies. He inherits land in uh, Romney March and he goes back and uh, he ends up becoming entangled with this uh, smuggler clan that's down there and in particular with Joss Doomsday. Um, and I think, is this very awful to say, but like, I, um, I, I, I'm I, just not a big fan of, I'm just not a big fan of reading about smuggling gangs and things. I'm probably just really basic and I, um, yeah, I just prefer London ballrooms and uh, society than, uh, than gangs. So I probably just why it didn't sparkle as much for me. But yeah, um, it was, it was nice that uh, they like all of Joss's family kind of comes into it as well and how protective they are of, of each other and um, also Sir Gareth um, when he goes back to his estate he actually ends up in a bit of a complicated situation with the rest of his family but I just loved the relationships that he had with the people that were in the house I don't want to give any spoilers a beautiful cover though with all the nature details and uh, yeah I actually am quite excited because I, I it's just been announced I think the gentle art of fortune hunting is getting some kind of sequel I think later this year so um yeah that would be nice um so the next book I also picked up in London and I bought it for a very particular reason because does this book look familiar at all well I can tell you it looks very like this book the kingdoms by Natasha Pulley which is like my favourite or one of my favourite books of all time. They're from different publishers and everything, but uh, yeah, too much of a coincidence, even the text, oh dear. But um, yes, uh, I Am The Sea by Matt Stanley. Um, so this is a very different book than The Kingdoms. It's very much uh, more of like a suspense, like thriller book. It's about this man called Meeks who gets sent to live to, in a lighthouse um, with these other keepers at the start of the 20th century. Yeah, it kind of starts off with a bit of suspense because he's being sent out there to replace the keeper who has died. Um, the tension really just keeps building up throughout the novel as uh, things keep happening. The winter is coming in, the conditions are getting very harsh. People are starting to lose their temper, temper there's kind of mixed personalities in the lighthouse. lighthouse. So um, yeah, I don't think I want to say any more of that because of spoilers, but um, yeah, no, it was an enjoyable read. Um, you know, more kind of thrillery than I'd be used to. And um, yeah, I guess I'd be more of a, it, yeah, I'd have liked more of like, I don't know, more about a lighthouse and less a thriller, but that is just purely my own personal preference. And uh, yeah, a, a, a good little thriller, as I said. Um, so the final book I'm going to talk about then, I actually read for People April. I did actually read another book for People April, but I just didn't manage to finish it. It was a collection of letters that soldiers wrote home um, during the First and Second World Wars and more uh, modern conflicts as well. So um, the nature of that collection doesn't really lead to like, stamping through it in a day you know it's nice to uh, take more time to read it so this is the only one I finished for people April unfortunately but it was a really good one and that is Snow Widow's Scott's Fatal Antarctic Expedition by the Women Left Behind by Catherine McGuinness this of course caught my attention straight away and um, because of the subject matter but also just the way it was it is such an interesting perspective to take and not something you think of a lot like it's so different nowadays like I mean if there was such dangerous exploration work to be taken on um probably I don't know married men probably would they be allowed to go like if there was if people you know people had died and didn't come back sometimes there was no like they didn't have the means to take out life insurance life assurance policy um to make sure that their family were looked after if they died so it's just a, a different time um and this follows the wives of five women um so 
Kathleen Scott, who was uh, Robert Scott's wife. N not a very likeable woman in the letters she was writing. She didn't really like the other women very much, which makes her hard to like as a woman myself, but um, still interesting. The mother of uh, Lieutenant Henry Bowers, who was a uh, bit uh, There was another mother, uh, Caroline Oates, who was uh, the mother of uh, Lawrence Titus Oates, and Oriana Wilson, who was the wife of Dr. Bill Wilson, who was the chief scientist. And also, um, interestingly, I suppose, and a good contrast with the others is Lois Evans um, and she was the wife of a petty officer so she was from a very different kind of class. At the start I was very confused um, I, like I, I knew a small bit about this expedition beforehand but if you didn't know anything about this expedition you'd be even more confused but I found it necessary to make an index of uh, everybody that was on the discovery expedition and um how they were and especially the women unfortunately they are mostly known by their husbands or sons so i did need to remember how they were linked to them but what did surprise me about this book and it was important that you knew about the rest of the people on the ship as well and it, some of them came up some of them didn't but um because it isn't just i i kind of expected it to be a biography just about the women but it really is i, I should have read the title more closely scott's fatal antarctic expedition by the women left behind so it doesn't focus on their early lives it does give a little bit about them what happened after the expedition um but um it is focusing on the expedition it, but it's a narrative as well of the actual expedition so you do see what happened to the men as well and that like it probably is necessary for the context of the letters um but yeah obviously just so tragic obviously a lot of people went on the discovery as far as antarctica but then a, a, a party of five were chosen for their final push to the South Pole and they unfortunately perished on the return journey so um, yeah you're just kind of it's really poignant because you're reading from the perspective of the women and they're looking forward to their husbands coming back um, and obviously you kind of know as the reader they never will my favourite lady to follow was Oriana Wilson uh, Bill Wilson's wife she kind of helped him with his scientific work and it, like they'd been married for I think uh, 10 years or something and they hadn't any, had any children and she really wanted a child um not an easy life but she still managed to I don't know she just came across as such an interesting person and they had such a close relationship um I, 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 I she was probably my favorite and I have a feeling that she was Catherine McGuinness's favorite as well um something and it is kind of it is something that Catherine alludes to at the start um that you can't look at these women through like a 21st century lens um like i mentioned that oriana wilson and bill didn't have any children that is the something that the women in here mention a lot it was obviously a huge priority for them and yeah i think it's just like um it's important that we let women from this time tell their us their own true emotions through letters and things as well so um yeah it was just it was just a good book and um yeah not one for the faint-hearted like it is very long it's probably one of the reasons i didn't read um as, as much this year either but um definitely very appreciated perspective on uh the women behind these expeditions just would have liked a bit more background on the women before the expedition however um I, I suppose it was imp it would be impossible <laughs> to give a bio a full biography of five different women with such different lifespans and different ages in one volume um if it was over a longer period just i don't know like just a, a chapter each would have been nice if you're interested in antarctic exploration definitely want to pick up definitely want to pick up and um yeah i really do want to read more about antarctic exploration because i think um the narratives i've read mostly have focused on the north pole so far so yeah i'll probably get pulled back into that hole again so yes this will probably be a short enough video so yes uh, let me know if you have thoughts on any of these books uh, thanks for listening thanks for watching and i'll see you next thursday for my next video